KCBS Television in Los Angeles, Southern California's most honored news broadcast. This is Channel 2 Action News at 11. Oh, the poor things, they just didn't have the spark. I think they're tired. Yeah, they're going to come back tomorrow and win the whole thing. I'll have to wait one more day. Good evening, everybody. I'm John Schubach. And I'm Trisha Toyota. It is true, the poor things. That's how long the Dodgers and their fans are going to have to wait to see if the Blue Crew is World Series bound. The Dodgers' 5-1 to loss tonight to the New York Mets sets up the final best-of-seven game tomorrow night at Dodger Stadium. And... Keith Olbermann here now with details for us. No, no joy in Lasorteville tonight, Tricia. Compared to the team's previous five Tong Wars, this game had little to recommend it either for excitement or for Dodger fans, but in terms of importance, it was just as big. Mets holding on to a 2 0 lead in the top of the fifth inning when Kevin McReynolds, with just three hits in his first 20 at bats in the series, crushes Tim Leary with a two run homer. McReynolds drove in three of the New York runs on the evening. Ailing Dodgers star Kirk Gibson played despite a re aggravated hamstring injury, but in two critical two on situations, he popped out. This time while representing the tying run in the fifth inning. Meantime, David Cohn chased by the Dodgers after two innings last Wednesday. Did all the chasing tonight. Five hits L.A. The Mets tying the series by winning 5-1. I just wanted to give us a chance to take this series to go to seven. And the way this series has been played, it's only poetic justice that it comes to game seven. It's, uh, it's going to be the biggest game of our lives, really, tomorrow. And, uh, you know, we're going to be very much up for it. Going to go home tonight, get a good night's sleep, and come out and have some fun tomorrow. The all-or-nothing Game 7 tomorrow night pits Oral Hershiser against the Mets' Ron Darling. Later on in sports, I'll be back with more on this game, including why it was over in the bottom of the first inning. Okay. All right, Keith, thank you very much. Other news tonight, a man with an alleged history of mental illness went on a shooting spree tonight in West L.A. He killed two people. Details at this hour are really not available, although we do know this. Police trying to figure out what happened. The victims identified. Uh, apparently to the authorities, but not publicly, a man and a woman each shot several times. After the shooting, the suspect barricaded himself in an apartment near Federal and Santa Monica in West L.A. SWAT teams were called in. The area was evacuated. The suspect, whose name has also not been released yet, gave up a short time later. He's being held for investigation of murder. And another scare in downtown Los Angeles tonight as fire swept through the Central Library again. This is the third time in the past two years that flames have raced through that 62-year-old structure. Action News was there as the firefighters arrived on the scene, and our Harvey Levin actually got inside the building as firefighters battled this fire. The blaze roared out of control a few minutes after 5 o'clock this afternoon. The staff and construction crew that had been renovating the building had already left for the evening, so no one was injured. A battery of firefighters was dispatched to the library. No small feat in downtown rush hour traffic. But they did arrive, quickly, and fought furiously to isolate, then contain the fire. It was mission accomplished in only half an hour. Initial damage reports are encouraging, though guarded. Not catastrophic. Was there a setback to be sure, but not catastrophic to the building. Action News shot these pictures inside the library basement where the blaze broke out. The official cause of the fire has not yet been determined. A spokesman for the fire department said he doesn't know yet whether anybody was in the immediate area where the fire broke out, nor does he know if the cause was arson or an accident. Construction materials were being stored in the basement, though the fire department is quick to caution they haven't yet figured out what ignited the blaze. As you can see, the smoke hit the second floor of the library where many valuable painted murals hang. But a library spokesman told us he's hopeful there was no damage to these murals because the smoke didn't reach a hot temperature before the firemen were able to get it under control. This is the third such blaze in less than three years. In April of 1986, an arsonist caused millions of dollars in damage to the structure and one of the most extensive collection of books west of Chicago. Four months later, the library was again the target of arson. The building is undergoing a $150 million rehabilitation. Fortunately, all the books had been removed from the library. Officials say it's too soon to know if the scheduled completion date of mid-1992 is in jeopardy as a result of today's blaze. And a footnote, a sprinkler system had been installed in the library, though it was not operational. Fire officials say sprinklers would have quickly doused the flames. Harvey Levin, Channel 2, Action News. Well, the election's about four weeks away, and in less than an hour, you have uh, just that much time to register. In fact, if you are not registered to vote for the election upcoming, midnight the deadline, of course. Uh, one of the few places to go until the clock strikes uh, 12 tonight is Cantor's Restaurant on Fairfax Avenue and 
the Fairfax district. So Republicans, Democrats, Independents took advantage of the last minute opportunity. If you're not registered to vote, you cannot, of course, vote for president or the insurance reform or the other individuals who are running for election come November. Some of the other places are in uh, the uh, Century Boulevard area, that is the Westway Post Office, Terminal Annex in North Alameda Avenue, and the Covina Police Department. And just head for us, they thought they were going to a wedding. Aha, but it was an undercover sting and it paid off big. That story next. most relaxing airport terminal. Take five at LAX, Delta's Oasis. What are you pouring for us here, David? Is this something special? Well, I found a new wine I think you might like. What is this? This has a beautiful color. This is really good. Is it hard to find? I we passed the same. Presidential campaign returns to California for the next couple of days as both candidates prep for Thursday night's debate at UCLA. Tonight, Vice President George Bush arrived at LAX aboard Air Force Two. Earlier today, the Vice President accused his opponent of protectionist demagoguery and said Dukakis is trying to fan people's fears about America's place in the world's economy. And Michael Dukakis will also be spending the night in the Southland. The Democratic candidate was greeted by an enthusiastic crowd at Burbank Airport as he arrived to begin cramming for the showdown. Before winging his way west, Governor Dukakis took a few jabs at his rival. He said Bush is satisfied with today and complacent about tomorrow. His theme song is, don't worry, be happy. And John, uh, today federal officials announced a major bust of a laundering operation involving drug monies. Authorities say an international banking institution spearheaded this elaborate scheme. And on page one, Jim Lampley says today's action may signal an important direction for international drug enforcement. Lampley. Trisha, drug enforcement authorities have acknowledged for years the futility of trying to intercept a meaningful percentage of the cocaine that flows into this country. Today, they struck at a more accessible target, drug profits, and the unscrupulous businessmen who have allied themselves with the Colombian cocaine cartel for the privilege of sharing in that money. The most significant aspect of this case is the incredible international cooperation that has developed. Customs agents in Great Britain and France worked with various American drug officers to nail 85 people, including nine officials of the Luxembourg-owned Bank of Credit and Commerce International, seventh largest private bank in the world. Eleven defendants were arrested when they responded to this invitation to a phony wedding in Tampa over the weekend. Agents say they were involved in an elaborate scheme to help Colombian kingpins hide and collect their millions. The undercover agents would, would get a call from a trafficker who needed something laundered. Uh, we would deploy agents to, for instance, New York. They'd pick up $500,000 in New York. They would carry it back to Tampa. BCCI helped us basically to purchase CDs. We would call Luxembourg and we place an order for a CD. The CD was used as collateral against a loan. The loan money then would be wired back to the states and eventually wind up in Uruguay and the cash would wind up eventually in Colombia. The operation was based in Tampa, but indictments were returned in nine other cities, including London and Paris. BCCI issued a statement denying any knowledge of its involvement in the scheme. The bank has a branch in Panama and is believed to have been an important way station in General Manuel Noriega's cocaine passages. For years now, some other nations have taken smug comfort in thinking of cocaine as an American problem. But in 1992, when Europe breaks down many of its economic and travel boundaries, the Colombian cartel will surely look to increase its profits there. With their cooperation in this case, French and British officials showed they understand that cocaine and the money that goes with it is everyone's problem. For John and Tricia. Okay, Joe. Thank you for that, Jim. We have much more ahead on uh, the Channel 2 Action News tonight. Porn star Pam Weston, did she mix business and pleasure with two Orange County judges? And also a Mac attack at Dodger Stadium makes it three and three. And as the East takes on the West, Lifestyles reporter Dorothy Lucy has the tale of two cities. Stay with us.
people who brought you big screen television comes the sound to go with it. Frankly, my dear, I don't get it. Introducing Mitsubishi Home Theater Systems. Now playing at a dealer near you. Rosebud. When manufactured... Kohler at this Kohler showroom. For me, all the fascination of the East is in her eyes. I see it in their fascinating traditions. I find it in the people. But really, there's only one way to describe all the fascination of the East. Malaysia. More than 50 people were arrested today during a demonstration at the FDA headquarters in Maryland. They were among hundreds of people demanding that the FDA speed up its approval of drugs to fight AIDS. A figure of President Reagan was hung in effigy, and protesters blocked exits and entrances to the buildings. Some employees were forced to go home. The FDA, for its part, says it is not holding up any anti-AIDS drugs, that there simply aren't any worth approving. Quite a story in Orange County tonight. Five judges in that county, municipal judges they are, are under investigation by the state commission involved in supervision of such judges. Two of the judges, Judge Brian Carter and Judge Calvin Schmidt, are accused of having sex with two prostitutes, one of them porn star Pam Weston. Both women had uh, a number of traffic tickets dismissed by Judges Carter and Schmidt. Three other judges are under investigation, two in connection with an unauthorized release of a Newport Beach prisoner. The fifth and only female judge involved in this investigation is accused of making ethnic slurs from the bench. The judges won't comment, but the state uh, law could certainly intervene, and the investigation is supposed to be con confidential, and they found guilty in all of what the charges have step, uh, specified so far. They could be removed from the bench. And, John, we have more now on a story we reported on last night. An American Airlines jet with 256 people aboard ran into engine problems and then was forced to dump fuel over Queens, New York. That plane was bound for Los Angeles. You're looking at pictures taken by amateur cameraman Phil Osborne of San Bernardino. He was aboard that flight when it took off from Kennedy. You can see the fuel coming out of the wing there. Pilot dumping 55,000 gallons of fuel over Jamaica Bay. The plane ha is sponsored by Coco's new bakery restaurants, now featuring their special prime rib dinner. Pretty good menu there. Let's see what the weather <laughs> serves up for tomorrow. John, I'm going to start with dessert and then work my way backwards, if you don't mind, tonight. You know, I think all of us would agree that certainly one of the most pleasurable parts of living in Southern California would be if you're lucky enough to have a boat and you can go out and enjoy it. Well, a little earlier tonight, Chopper 2 was flying down around Long Beach in the L.A. Harbor, and I want you to look at the middle slip here, that boat right there. It's 75 feet long. It's perched, it's called the Duchess 3, and as we move around the thing, the interesting, oh my goodness, is that all we got to say? Oh. You had luck, pal. Yeah, I'm sorry, do you know what happened? The engine room sprung a leak. It's half <laughs> submerged. Oh, no. oh, no. And they notified the owner tonight, it's over in the East Basin, and I hope he's not waiting for a ship to come in because wow. that thing's underwater tonight. Hey, San Bernardino, you were the warmest spot in the country today. You made it to 99 degrees. Our LA Civic Center high was 80. We had a low of 65. Right now we have partly cloudy skies around the Southland with 65 degrees, north breezes at five miles per hour. Trisha kind of gave it away. If you like today, you're really gonna like tomorrow because we're not gonna change it very much. Maybe a couple of degrees warmer for the valleys near 70 at the coast. You're gonna have some fog to deal with in the morning for certain. 95 in the low desert, 87 in the high desert. Here's a quick question for you, John. What happens when you get bitterly cold air moving over warm lake waters. What happens? I would say that you're going to be very miserable. <laughs> would somebody get that man a room? <laughs> no, you're going to get some snow, and they've had it. Great Lakes, some lake effect snow this evening, and they're not going to get that much warmer tomorrow, so certainly it's a very fall-like forecast for many parts of the Northeast, and they're not feeling very comfortable. <laughs> I guess that's the moral of the story. So tonight, we have some scattered showers in the northern part of uh, Nevada, also over into California, and a spattering of uh, rain mixed, a little bit of wet snow tonight because of the cool temperatures. I'm going to put the map in motion for you this evening. We have this spinning low up in the Gulf of Alaska.
Alaska. It's sending a couple of cloud banks, frontal system waves our way, but most of the rain is going to stay well north of the Bay Area, moving up into Medford, Oregon, around Seattle. We're going to be having some residual cloud cover over the next couple of days. There it is for tomorrow. Maybe a chance of some light snow flurries around the Great Lakes. A little frost on their pumpkin tonight. We'll have some hazy afternoon sunshine, but we're going to have to burn off those morning clouds right after breakfast, okay? Here's your forecast tonight. I'm going to call it World Series weather. Mr. Optimism. We're going to have it tomorrow for certain. Fair skies, some low clouds tonight. We'll see 80 tomorrow, 80 again on Thursday, and maybe the high 70s to about 80 degrees Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. All in all, not much of a change over the next couple of days, but very comfortable numbers any way you look.